all right everyone welcome to this video uh, this video is the first in what I intend in a series that I intend to do with the goal of introducing people to diffusion image filtering so before I get to the main content of this video I would like to motivate why this is an interesting problem why you, sh you should bother studying it the first motivation, maybe like monetary motivation, we all know it's that person, oh, I'm only going to study something if I can make money off of this. And uh, for uh, image filtering in particular, this is a problem that has commercial applications. There are marketing agencies, studios, all that make a living. The, the better that the images that they produce look, the more money that they get. So they're really interested in buying software that does that for that for them. For example, Photoshop, it was a paid application. And then even if it's like ad funded software like Instagram, for example, it's a social network. But at the beginning, it really took off in part because of all the filters that it had for the images that people uploaded there. So it's when you can actually uh, make images prettier, you usually do get monetary compensation for that. The second one is more technical, that hardware is still not strong enough to solve it trivially, so we can differentiate ourselves, right? So if you do like any course in a numerical analysis, usually they will say, oh, today computers are too powerful, you just download this numerical package that does everything for you but for images that's really not the case and essentially because it, these problems are different than those that you see in a course because if you want to do something commercially you're like looking at an image with I don't know 4k resolution or very high resolution uh, and usually this filter is incorporated in some software where the user needs to tweak some parameters until the image looks good and uh, they need almost instant feedback to do their tweaking and uh, to accomplish this you usually need to run stuff on the graphics card which is a much more restricted environment than the CPU so most of the numerical packages out there will not do it for you so you really need to work to get the performance you want to make the algorithm good. The third motivation is more or less in line with the second is that it's a field where knowledge matters, right? If you you have good calculus skills, if you have good computer skills, you can differentiate yourself from the competition and and make a filter that solves a very specific problem. The fourth one is kind of the counterpoint to the previous Although it does require some knowledge, it is not really rocket science, it's not like as advanced as most research problems. I mean, you do, with all the material that you get from like uh, two first years in any STEM course with calculus of several variables, you can really start working on it. It's not really that complicated. You can, uh, can uh, start once you have the right background. And I think the last one is that really most important for me is that the final word has not really been said on the matter. Every day you see companies starting out uh, trying to sell a different filter, uh, people trying different stuff, uh, either with GPU optimizations or with some nonlinear filters for a targeted specific problem. So. It's really an active field, and then you can. There's a high chance that you can contribute useful. Well, that was the motivation for the series, but the motivation for this video in particular, since it's the first, it's a bit different. We're not gonna dive into the most complicated stuff. We're gonna start. We need to start somewhere, and then, since we the topic is diffusion filters, we're going to start with the simplest diffusion process of all which is the linear one-dimensional heat equation and it has the advantage that it is simple and we can code it in a few lines with any numerical package out there. In my case I'm going to use Python. Alright, so let's get started. 
So I'm going to open my notes here. So here we have, we start with the heat equation. So what is the heat equation? Well, the heat equation, uh, the, what the field that we're going to set up to solve in this equation is, we'll call it the U field. It is a function that depends on x, a variable representing space, and t, the variable representing time. The heat equation is a simple partial differential equation. It seems that the partial derivative of u with respect to t equals a constant d times the second partial derivative of u with respect to x. This d, in some physics application, it's usually called a thermal diffus diffusivity, I think. Uh, but uh, in more general content, context, it is just called a diffusion coefficient. Yeah. And what is interesting about this is that this equation alone does not specify a unique solution. There are several, and in fact, the space of solutions of this has an interesting property that if you have two solutions, u1 of xt and u2 of xt, from these two you can build another solution by means of a constant a times u1 plus a constant b times u2, right? And then this equation here is just the proof of that. It's very simple. It's just the fact that the derivative is linear, that uh, the derivative of a constant times a function is a constant times a derivative, and a derivative of the sum is the sum of derivatives. From this, you can just substitute this thing here, and since this satisfies the equation, this larger thing also does. It's very simple. If you're going to go to very abstract mathematical language, we say that the space of solutions of this equation forms a vector space. All right, so what do we do to obtain a unique solution? We need to impose what is known as boundary condition. So uh, instead of also satisfying this equation, we also require that the field at the time t equals 0 is equal to a given function f that we're going to specify later. And uh, for the, we also require that the field will vanish at the points of space x equals 0 and x equals l for all the values we set it equal to 0. So perhaps it's a good idea to draw this. So we have here uh, maybe uh, fine, uh, okay, all right, so here we have t, and here we have x, here we have the point 0, here we have the point l, and t is in time, and we have a given field This is the field that we have f of x and this is t equals 0, right? And this is the initial configuration. Then we're, when we're going to evolve this solution, you can see that at some po later point t, we're going to maybe draw with uh, different color, we are going to have something like this, right, and then this is just u of x at the time t, and what the, what, and then what the boundary condition says that they are zero here and zero through all this evolution and also the point L, and what the heat equation says is how we're going to evolve from this signal f of x, which is also ux0, if you want, uh, how we're going to evolve from this initial signal to this one. And once we specify all this data, we have a unique solution to our problem. This evolution from this red signal to the blue is uniquely defined. All right? Good. Good. So, so how do we solve this? Well, it is kind of a black magic, but it's some black magic that you will find in any 
introductory course on partial differential equations. So we start with a guess, uh, an ansatz for the uxt function. We say that it is a function of x times a function of t. There's a priori no reason why it should have this form, but we'll see it's useful to guess this. And the whole point of this ansatz is that when we substitute it in this equation, we get this, right? We get x of x times t prime of t equals dx double prime of x times t of t. And we can rearrange this so that we have t prime of t divided by t of t equals dx double prime of x divided by x of x. And this separation here is very interesting because you see that the left-hand side only depends on t, while the right-hand side only depends on x. But they're equal. So how is that possible? Well, this is only possible if these things are constants, right? And more or less with a crystal ball, we set this constant here equals to minus k square. We set that this thing here is equal to minus k square. And if we rearrange further, we have this ordinary differential equation for x. And once we set up this constant, we also have this ordinary differential equation for t. All right, and so both of these equation, uh, differential equations are well known. So for the one for x, the solution of it, you can solve it in your favorite method. You find that x of x equals a cosine kx plus b sine kx, right? And then once we substitute this in this boundary condition here, what we see is that we have a, a, that x of 0 needs to be 0, right? And then we see that a cosine of 0 is 1, so this term becomes a, and b sine of 0, sine of 0 is 0, this b term vanishes. So x 0 equals 0 implies that a equals 0, so that means that the cosine term does not exist, right? And then in the fourth condition is analogous, we substitute it on L, and then we see that B sine K L is equal to zero, All right? Now here we could also set B equals to zero, but then we kind of failed at finding a solution, right? We found the solution U equals zero, which is the trivial one, it does not help us. So, so for us to continue further, we need to set sine of KL equals zero, and then this, of course, happens when KL is an integer multiple of pi. We write KL equals n pi. And isolating K, we have K equals n pi divided by L. And incidentally, that's the reason why we chose a negative constant here. Because if we set it positive when we were going to solve this, we would have no non-trivial solutions. We would have that only zero is a solution, and we don't want that. Well, anyway, once we have this value of k here that we find, we can substitute it in this equation for t. And if you solve them again with your favorite method, you will see that it is just t of t equals a constant c times exponential of minus n square pi square dt divided by l square. All right? Cool. So what we found here is that we have a family of solutions u, n, x, t which are the, a solution of the heat equation, and then we have a n uh, given by a n sine n pi x divided by L, exponential of minus n square pi square dt divided by L square. And then you might be asking yourself, so what is the point of this? Because what I did, if we, what we got from the, our methods, if you, if so you see that all of, when if you substitute t equals zero here, you see that we have signs, right? So all the solutions that we found are signs. They are either something like this, or something like this, or if we go, we can have more fun with this. We can have like three. All right. So these are the family of solutions that we found. They're signs, and there is no re reason for them to be equal to our f function, right? There's no reason. But, and that, that's where the brilliant thing comes through, because of the linearity, 
any sum of signs will also be, give a solution to the heat equation. So if we could somehow express f of x as a sum of these signs, then we're done. And that's exactly what is done here. So we can get, uh, we have the most general solution to the heat equation is simply the sum of these from n equals 0 to infinity. And if we substitute the equal 0 here, if we can somehow express f of x as a sum of a n times these signs, we should be done solving our problem, right? And this is done with a mathematical trick. So well, how do we find the a n's which make this equation true? To solve this, there is like this integral identity that the integral of 0 to L of sine n pi x divided by, uh, by L sine m pi x divided by L. If n and m are integers, it's what happens is that if n and m are the same integers, then this is, this gives L divided by 2. And if there are different integers, then this integral gives 0, right? This is what this Kronecker delta thing means. It is 1 if the integers are equal and 0 if they are different. Yeah. So with this identity, we can like do some trick. We can pick this formula. We multiply by sine m on both sides, and then we integrate. And when we switch the order of summation and integral on this side, and then we substitute, we have like a sum of from n to infinity of something that is only non zero at m, and then we get a m l divided by 2. And we can, of course, isolate a m and change the letters, and we have that a n is just 2 divided by l, integral of 0 to l of f of x sine of n pi x divided by l, right? And with this information, you can solve the problem. Oh, and also one something that's noted here in the text is that the solution to the heat equation actually depends on the product dt. Uh, so which means that if, for example, you double the diffusivity and run it for half of the time, you get the same result. And this is actually a very interesting symmetry because some books, they always set the equals 1 because of this, because the value of these kind of arbitrary. It's something that's nice to notice, but it's not really fundamental to understanding the problem. All right. And then that's it. So if your goal was to just study in the abstract way when you're in a math course, for example, we would be done here, right? So if you're in a math course, what your professor would do is you would, he would give you an f of x. From this f of x, you would evaluate this integral for uh, and calculate the constants a n, and then you would substitute it here, and then you have the solution of the heat equation for all time. Even though you, you might not be able to sum this, you have a series expansion that you can evaluate the value to any precision you want, right? But in practice, we live in a computer and uh, we need to sample signals, right? Uh, so, in fact, we do not really have, so if we go back to Krita, so let us write this. So, the signals that we have, but this is faster, right? So, oh, I need the black. So, let's go here. So, in the continuous world, we have signals like this, right? So, but in, in the digital world, what have we need to sample this? So, we're going to have uh, discrete intervals, all of them at the same time. And what we actually have is just these data points here, right? This is all that we have. And these data points, if we zoom it here, the spacing between them, we're going to call delta x, which is the 
called the sampling interval right all right so if we go back to time with so if we subdivide the zero l interval into n regions of size delta x we can see that delta x equals just l divided by n and instead of an f of x we have f of i which is f i dot x which is just what they pointed out here so in our case this here would be the f i that the text refers all right cool so this is one issue all right and the other is that this this sum is actually infinite right so if you want to calculate we have sum over infinite frequencies and the computer does not perform infinite summations well, the thing is, uh, so we need to provide a cutoff. We only sum up to a given frequency, and for reasons that are also related to this sampling, we do also do not need to sum all frequencies. We only need to sum up to the Nyquist frequency. So if we go back to Krita here, so let us go, let us er erase this, right? So you can imagine, so these are the grid points, right? So you can imagine that if the, your signal is something like this, for example, so if it is like this, all right? This means that if this is a sign and the frequency is so high that uh, you always hit these points here at zero, right? So if you try to sample this very this sign of very high frequency, you always get zero, you not get anything. If you try to sample something with even higher frequency, you would get uh, uh, to get a frequency that is lower than it actually is. So what actually this means is that it only makes sense to uh, consider frequencies when uh, before this, this thing happens. And when does this thing happen? When, well, if you has, uh, call this frequency k, and this is half the period of a sine, which is pi, then this happens when k times delta x equals pi, right? And then this is the equation that the text, oh, sorry. This is the equation of the text of k delta x equals pi, k equals pi delta x, we substitute the delta delta x is L divided by n, so we get that this Nyquist frequency is large n, the number of samples, pi divided by L. And since the frequencies are given with small n, pi divided by L, what this actually means is that we can only pick the frequency modes which are smaller than this number of intervals thing, which is actually a pretty, pretty neat row. And the final issue when working with the computers is it refers to the calculation of the integral, right? So the thing is that when we compute this integral, we can just approximate it by the trapezoidal rule. Well, uh, if you're familiar with the trapezoidal rule, there is like some uh, delta x divided by two at the boundaries, but we removed them because they are zero anyway. But in any case, we will we approximate this integral by this sum which will give the uh, the trapezoidal row for it all right cool so if we substitute like all of that stuff so when we are going to evaluate these an things here right which is given by this formula in our digital world we have that an equals 1 divided by 2n, sum of k to 1 to n minus 1, uk at 0, which is fk, right? Sine pi and k divided by n, all right? And uh, when we going to evaluate the field configuration at u, un at a time t, this is another sum, a very similar one, unt, sum of k equals 1 to n minus 1, a k sine pi and k divided by n and then this exponential here right okay so and then with this we solve the problem but there is still an issue here so 
Oh, okay, so the text just notice that now there's another symmetry here, which is this exponential it only depends on dt divided by L square. And uh, what that this actually means is that if you find a solution for a given L, you can like transform it for an even another L if you change the constants. But again, this is not really important for our goals here. But one issue here is that this sum that we found has O n square complexities. So imagine that you're like in a computer, for example, you have like uh, n of these terms, right? And each one of them you have to sum n numbers. Right? So to evaluate this, you would have a loop, and inside this loop, another loop to sum. So we would have, on average, a large n square computations. And to evaluate this UN, also large n square calculations, right? And this is low. With n square complexity, you could do like perhaps n equals 1,000, 1,000 samples in in one second, for example, which is not that good. So usually we can do in one second everything that fits in RAM. So we this algorithm is not very optimized, but we can do better, right? And then we can do better with the results of this section three here, which is when we reduce the problem to a Fourier transform, right? So if you look at this equation, we said that there is some sine. Yes, we see sine pi n k divided by n. You see some one divided by two n here and the other you don't see it, right? We see this. And if you look at the formula for the discrete Fourier transform, the, for the discrete Fourier transform, you have something like this. You have xn equals some sum times a complex exponential. This i is the imaginary unit. We see nk, like we see in the other forms, it divided by n. And in the reverse one, we see 1 divided by n, right? Which, which is, is very interesting, interesting which to... makes you wonder can this problem be reduced to a discrete Fourier transform? And if this insight is true, if it really can, it's very good because we have a very fast algorithm to calculate the discrete Fourier transform, which is called the fast Fourier transform, well, very appropriately named, right? The FFT. And uh, we're not going to detail how it does this, but it does in O n log n complexity. And so just like that, we went from like being able to compute like 1,000 samples in a second to around maybe 300,000, 1 million samples in a second because this is almost linear, log n grows extremely slow, right? And uh, so there is like a lot of theory behind the discrete Fourier transform. I'm not going to detail for the purposes, I'll just write down the answer. So how do you use the discrete Fourier transform to so this problem, well, so first of all, I think it's time that we set what the problem that we want to solve. So the problem that we're going to solve, so let me go to VS Code. Okay, so then we go this, so yeah, so we have time, so let's go this, all right? So, all right, suppose we want to solve like this, problem, right, which is this signal that is 0 until we have the position 1, uh, from 0 to 1, and the signal is 0 from 0 to 0 0.25, then it suddenly jumps to 1, and then it stays until 0 0.5, and then it falls back to 0 at 0 0.75, and then it stays at 0, right? Suppose that you have this signal that you want to solve the heat equation for, and it turns out that what you need to do in order to apply the Fourier transform, it's very, very interesting. Let's just see. I guess I'm, got, I'm not going to prove because we don't really have time, but you can, of course, the AD study. So if you have a signal like this, right? So, so like the one we want, so our signal is going to be something like this here, right? So we have this, this is the signal I showed you, right? 
What we need to do to apply to reduce the problem to an FFT is we make this an odd signal. We just repeat it in this side here, like this, all right? And then we take the Fourier transform. And then this is what the text defines here, right? So we consider this function, which is the same for 0 to L, and then uh, from minus L to L it is this. And then if you sample this guy with n intervals, oh, this is also important, if you sample this guy with uh, n intervals, you also put n here so that this thing is divided now with 2n. And if you do the discrete Fourier transform of this, you will see that what you're actually computing is something proportional to this here, right? And then the inverse transform as well. It is pretty crazy. Maybe you have, might have a look at this later, but this is how it is done. And yeah, this is how you reduce this problem to the FFT. And with this information, we can just start. So we have this code here, it is Python code. So most of this stuff here is like just setting up the pl problem and plotting and initializing. But if we go through the code, uh, more or less, uh, just give an overview. So this is f, which is, this is the function I told you that's being plotted here, right? It, this is more or less the definition of it. And then there's something to initialize the graph. And then here I use 101, n equals 101, which means I will use 100 samples. This, in the conventions of the nodes, this n would be 100, right? And then, while well, we set up x, we get a linear space of separated by 0 0.01. And then, this simply samples the this f signal at the given sampling rate that we want. And to this sig here, this with 0 and pure a reversed 0 whatever, does exactly this which outlined here. It creates this odd function signal to apply the fast Fourier transform, right? And then what we do, we simply take the, it's called frac sig, which is the fast Fourier transform of the signal, right? And then, because I, since I'm using NumPy, so if you multiply two uh, NumPy arrays with each other, NumPy will understand that you want to multiply the elements, multiply it element-wise right? So what I do, so you can understand is that this uh, thing here is, so we evaluate this, where is it? Ah, we have the, evaluate the ANs, and then this thing here we put AK times the exponential, and then we, and then this sum here is the inverse here transform right so we have here we evaluate these coefficients that we need to multiply and then uh, here for every time t we set the uh, we, we prepare the, this exponential function that we're going to set the frequency coefficients then we initialize them and then when we evaluate the inverse fast Fourier transform we multiply them, right? So, and then when you're going to plot, we just, this, when we get things back, we just want this part of the signal to plot, and then that should be it. We just, the, the code is a bit complicated, but it is like, the idea is pretty simple. You just uh, do the Fourier transform, you multiply with some coefficients that you set up, and then you transform it back. And that's it, right? And then if we now I can comment this thing out, and then I can just evaluate for lots of times, and then we can set. So you see, and then we have like only 50 lines of Python code, and most of them are just initializing stuff, right? So you can see that we have this signal at t equals zero, and at t equals zero dot zero zero two, we have the yellow one, which is like this. Right, 
So we see that uh, this, this straight jump kind of shifted to the rotated to the side fast. It, it, the heat equation kind of moves the thing. And this, the stronger the jump is, the faster it decays, right? So you can see that this guy rotated faster than this one, right? And it goes, keeps on decaying, decaying, decaying. And then when, so because our boundary conditions allow the total field, uh, the total amount of field in the simulation to leak out, it will eventually go uh, to zero. And you see that it actually goes slower because these time intervals, they are not evenly spaced, right? So if we did an animation, so this part here would be very fast, while this one it's at the end would be very slow, right? And that's pretty cool. We, uh, with this FFT formalism, we essentially solved the heat equation in a few lines of code. But there is more to it. There is something that we still need to look into. And this thing is here the interpretation, uh, we, it's a, an operation called the circular convolution. So if we have two signals, okay, F and G, the signal, con the circular convolution of them is just given by this formula. So the best way to see this is if we think like, for example, polynomial division, so polynomial multiplication, sorry. So if you have like so if you have for example 1 plus 2x plus 3x squared and you have 1 plus x here Right, and then you want to multiply these things. So you can say, so what is the what, the term with uh, the, the term that multiplies uh, x equals uh, x to the power of zero? Well, it's just one because there's only one. But for x, we have two uh, x and x, so we have three x, right? And for x squared, we have well three x squared times one, and 2x times x, which is 2x squared, so we have 5x squared and 3x squared plus x is just 3x cubed, right? And then the thing is, if you look just at the coefficients, this sequence 1, 3, 5, 3 is the convolution of 1, 2, 3 with 1 and 1, right, because here there's only 1, right. And the circular convolution it needs for it to specify, so if we like 3, so what actually means is that this 3 here is identical to 0, 1, so the circular convolution would actually be 4, 3, 5, because well, because now we are treating x0 in the same foot as x3 if we have a, a size n of 3, right? Uh, so there is a result, like I said, we're not going to prove anything here in this video, that if you have a signal that uh, the circular convolution, you, the, the right way to do this using modulo or arithmetic or whatever, but if you take the circular convolution of two signals, then the fast Fourier transforms of them will be multiplied by each other, right? And if you see what we're doing here in this thing is that we're picking something, we're constructing something and multiplying by the fast Fourier transform the signal and then inverse transforming it back, right? So if we just inverse transform this thing that we created, these coefficients, we would have a signal, right? And then we could understand what we're doing as a, conv a circular convolution with that signal, all right? And this is exactly what uh, we're going to say. What is this signal? We can just, instead of plotting this, I will comment out the, 
other lines of the code, I could simply plot this mysterious signal to see what it is, all right? And then we save, and then if we put it here, what we see is, okay, so we see that it is just one at a very long peak, but let us remove time zero just for a while so that we can see the rest, all right? So, and then when we see now, okay, so maybe it is better to put this thing in the center now. So, okay, so you see, it is kind of a Gauss over here, you see it's, it's kind of zero, right? And if you see like the circular convolution, the thing is like circular, it doesn't matter what it is. You can kind of see that it looks like a Gaussian, right? It is as as the time increases the size of this Gaussian uh, grows right and this makes sense because if you understand this this is like the formula of a Gaussian so if for k you see k square you act exponential of minus k squared is the formula of a Gaussian and if you for here transform a Gaussian it gives another Gaussian all right it's not exactly a Gaussian because of the boundary condition so the the best mathematical name is called the heat kernel, this signal that we're plotting here. But for small times, it is this heat kernel is well approximated by a Gaussian. And this, uh, okay, so this doesn't give us any insight on how to solve the problem efficiently, but it does gives us a very powerful hint when we going to define approximation methods to solve this equation later because this interpretation as a convolution with this mysterious signal that we find the that we find the coefficients will be very helpful when we derive approximation methods so what all of this is saying is that to solve the heat equation you need to make uh, each, uh, so if you see, for example, that this is f at the time of t and this is the initial f, right? So each, at the point t, the signal is just a weighted average of all of the other positions. And for very small t's, this weighted average is well approximated by a Gaussian. And for now, this is all that we need to know. We're going to expand on this idea later. In, in in the next videos and but for this video that's all i have for you and uh, that's it for now and i hope to see you guys in the next video bye bye